Hi all, welcome to week three. This week we'll be focusing on the musculoskeletal alterations and this video is just to give you the basics on the musculoskeletal system before our lecture. So bones give form to the body, support our tissues and permit, permit movement by providing points of attachment for the muscles. Many bones meet at um, movable joints that determine the type and extent of movement possible. Bones also protect many of the body's vital organs. For example, the bones of the skull, thorax, and pelvis are hard exterior shields that protect the brain, heart, and lungs, and reproductive and urinary organs, respectively. Within certain bones, the marrow cavities serve as storage sites for the hematopoietic stem cells that form both blood and immune cells. In adults, Blood cells originate exclusively in the marrow cavities of the skull, vertebrae, ribs, sternum, shoulders, and pelvis. Bones also have a crucial role in mineral homeostasis, storing minerals, uh, calcium, phosphate, carbonate, magnesium, that are essential for proper performance of many delicate cellular mechanisms. And they have a role in hormone homeostasis and assist in maintaining normal immunologic function. So when we look at the image of a long bone, we can see much more is going on than expected. Bones are quite vascular, which facilitates oxygen and nutrient transport between bone tissue and blood vessels. To consider just how important this is, we will explore a femoral fracture. An adult femur can hold three to four pints of blood out of an average eight to 12 pints total. Hemorrhage from a femoral fractured can be lethal. So there are two types of bone marrow in bones. Red marrow, the site of blood cell formation, which will be explored in the hematologic section of this course, and yellow marrow, which is mostly adipose. So bones consists of a gelatinous combination of glycoproteins and bone cells. Bone rigidity is primarily from crystallized calcium and other mineral components. This combination of minerals, collagen, and other proteins allow for primary properties of osseous connective tissues, length and strength. These properties allow for weight-bearing activities. The image shown here are of an intraosseous needle and catheter, often called an IO. This catheter is used in the field in an emergency situation where vascular access is needed, but not able to be obtained efficiently through a typical vascular access method. So this needle enters deep into the bone where fluids and medications enter the vasculature and can be used in the body. The chemical composition and cellular components of bone is unique in that it creates new tissues as needed, rather than scar tissue after damage and repair. After receiving a chemical signal the bone repair is needed, osteoclasts reabsorb old bone while osteoblasts lay down new bone. Some osteoblasts then convert to osteocytes which become functional bone cells. Okay, so bone remodeling is the process of turning old bone into new bone. In normal physiology, bone remodeling begins when RANK ligand a cytokine is released by osteoblasts and binds to the RANK receptors on osteoclasts. RANKL is released in specific situations, like mechanical stress, such as in exercise, to main quality when microfractures actually occur, such as, I don't know, jumping out of a two-story window, or when minerals such as calcium or phosphate are needed in the bloodstream. So osteoprotein gerin, OPG, is released by osteoblasts once enough bone resorption has taken place and blocks RANKL from binding to RANK. The bone resorption process is inhibited when OPG is released. This entire process takes about three to six months to complete. Here's just a little analogy to help you understand bone remodeling a little better. Never knew you were going to be civil engineers, did ya? Here we can 
look at the process again, as I know some students often struggle with this concept of chemical signaling. We have happy bone producers, RANK and RANKL, and osteoclasts. RANK binds to RA RANKL and osteoclasts to promote new bone growth. We move old bone osteoclasts so osteoblasts can build the matrix. The inhibitor, a great supervillain name if you ask me, is OPG. OPG stops RANK from binding to RANKL and reduces bone demineralization. Now, estrogen plays an important role in bone growth and repair. Estrogen limits the amount of RANKL expressed. In the presence of estrogen, RANKL is reduced. So bone loss is limited. However, with the loss of estrogen, RANKL has free reign and can lead to excess bone loss. Therefore, postmenopause bone loss is a huge risk, and we'll explore this more in detail in class lecture. Synovial joints are marvels of natural engineering that give us a remarkable range of motion. Imagine each of these joints as a specialized structure filled with lubricating liquid known as synovial fluid, nestled in a small cavity. This setup is what allows the ends of our bones to glide past each other in various directions smoothly. Our bodies are full of synovial joints, and they come in a few different types. Take the ball and socket joint in our shoulders and hips. They're like the multi-directional joysticks of our bodies offering a wide range of movement across multiple axes. Then we have the pivotal joints, like the one at the base of our skull, C1, which lets us swivel our heads to look over our shoulder. Then there's the elbow, and that's a perfect example of a hinge joint, designed primarily for bending and straightening motions. Our wrists have condyloid joints that add a bit more flair, allowing for bending and straightening and moving side to side, and even circular movements. Then there are plane joints between our bones and our feet that enable them to glide over each other, and the saddle joints at the base of our thumbs that allow for gripping and rotating actions that set our hands apart. Unfortunately, these incredible joints can be affected by conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disorder that targets these joints of flexibility and movement, also, the synovium, the lining that produces synovial fluid, can alter in fluid volume, influencing our joint mobility. This lining can become inflamed or infected, which can lead to further complications and affect our movement. From our fluid and electrolyte lessons, we know that muscle is hydrophilic. Muscle is 75% water. It also contains 20% proteins with other various compounds completing the composition. With this kind of water reserve, we can see why someone with a lot of muscle tissue has less risk for fluid imbalances. Muscle functions to accomplish work, and though that level of work varies, muscles do work in each of us. The byproducts of metabolism needed to provide that work can be found in the bloodstream and are significant laboratory findings that can give us clues about body function. Our three main tests that fit this profile are creatinine, myoglobin, and lactic acid. Creatinine is a byproduct of normal skeletal muscle metabolism. When our kidneys are functional, the serum level remains relatively constant, except in cases of sudden extreme exercise. Myoglobin is typically released in cases of severe or extreme rapid muscle breakdown. This may be a crushing injury or from ischemia to the skeletal muscle. Elevated myoglobin leads us to conclude there is some injury to the muscle, but not atrophy. As we know, these large proteins can overload the nephrons and lead to AKI or worsen CKD. Lactic acid is the end product of anaerobic metabolism in muscle tissue. Remember that lactic acid leads to pain. If you exercise or perform strenuous activity, such as running upstairs, you may feel the burn thanks to lactic acid. When the body is starved for oxygen, such as in hypoxia or hypoxemia related to sepsis, lactic acid is released by the muscles. Therefore, lactic acid is used as a marker for the severity of sepsis and other systemic ischemic events.
Without training, muscle mass will decrease at a rate of about half a pound per year after the age of 30. This loss decreases metabolism and is the reason that as people age, they will gain weight without additional consumption of calories. This loss of muscle equates to adding about one pound of adipose per year. Sarcopenia is evident from about age 50 and accelerates at age 70. This loss of muscle mass is due to a decline in neuromuscular function and decline in anabolic hormones, which encourages muscle cell growth. However, muscles are trainable, and sarcopenia can be delayed with regular activity. As the body ages, bone remodeling and mineralization takes longer to accomplish. Bone resorption exceeds bone creation, especially in postmenopausal estrogen-dominant individuals. Estrogen typically decreases the ability of RANKL to initiate the resorption process. When levels of estrogen decline, more RANKL is available for stimulation of the RANK receptor. This increases bone resorption, but not bone formation. We see an overall reduction in bone mass. By the age of 70, most estrogen dominant individuals have lost 50% of their total, total bone mass. This can lead to pain, deformity, and severe fractures, limiting mobility and ability. Delay in the bone remodeling cycle also affects testosterone dominant individuals, but later in life and to a lesser degree due to the drastic hormonal influences and the higher bone mass and typically more physically active. active. This once was the standard, but with modernization and progress, the once mainly physical labor performed by testosterone dominant individuals is becoming less of an influence. Basically, higher bone mass, less estrogenetic influence, and more physical activity set up the individual to have less bone mass loss with aging. Bone loss is increased in individuals who use tobacco, drink alcohol, have calcium deficiencies, and overall lack physical activity.